Okay, so what I want to talk about really more is early loss of ambulation because many of the later issues, the respiratory, I can't cover. I'm not a respiratory therapist. And a lot of what happens when the boys are weaker is about the position they're sitting in, the activities they're doing. A lot of it is related to what they want to do, but a lot of it is about position and we'll talk about that. So most importantly is early loss of ambulation. What are we doing around the time the boys are losing ambulation? And we have a big number of boys with lockdown, with COVID, who are losing ambulation because we know that in a school day, they're much more active than they have been even at home. And the things that are most important about losing ambulation, obviously, is increasing weakness, increasing contractures. Scoliosis rarely causes loss of ambulation, but falls, injuries, and fractures, as is mentioned in those films, is a big cause of loss of ambulation. Fear of falling, fear of falling and not being able to get up, constant falling, that you're always falling. It becomes unpleasant. It becomes scary. And I never ever underestimate how much fear these boys have when it's getting harder to walk, when just standing up feels so difficult that fear and motivation really are a big part of stopping walking and obviously increasing height and weight <coughs> excuse me will play a big part in losing ambulation fractures and the management of fractures will depend where in the bone that it's happened the most common fractures we know are vertebral fractures, although one would hope that steroid management would prevent that and regular monitoring, but it still happens. Long bones, so the legs and the arms, particularly from falls. Falling onto an arm can break upper arm bone, it can break lower arm bones, we know about legs. And the problems that we have a contractures caused by the position in the plaster. Difficulty with surgical fixation, either because the fracture is difficult to fix, but it must be fixed. There is no justification for boys now ever being left in bed or left with a plaster they can't move. Big problem with a leg fracture or an arm fracture is that the boys will lean away from the side of the fracture. And you must be aware of this because we had a boy who fractured his arm. He had a straight spine, three weeks in a sling, and he leaned away from the fracture and ended up with a curve in his spine. And the same with plasters on legs. It makes you higher on the plaster side it makes it harder to sit straight and you will lean. So it's very much with a leg fracture up to the occupational therapist to try and make your legs level by raising the leg that wasn't fractured to make you sit evenly. Because if you have a long plaster on your leg, you will sit to one side. Obviously pain is a feature and some of the boys do find the fractures are quite painful and loss of ambulation and function because you are getting weaker anyway it's too scary to get back on your feet and also the weakness caused while you are in plaster can make it impossible to walk again so fractures do cause a lot of problems so when you first lose ambulation, there are three choices. To continue walking in orthoses. To stand in a standing frame or standing wheelchair, some standing equipment, or to stop all standing. 
And while we as physiotherapists feel that standing is beneficial for contractures, for spine, for many, many things, not all boys want to do it. And it is very difficult for a lot of parents to force the boys into standing when they don't want to. <clears throat> it's often easier if there is some sort of facility for standing at school, in a games lesson or in art lessons or in a particular situation where there are other boys with muscular dystrophy or other children in wheelchairs who are standing all together. But you can't stand in a classroom in a standing frame if you're the only child standing up. And it's very hard to constantly be taken out of the classroom if there is all the other children are in the class. So you have to build in standing time that works. And good time for standing time is using Xboxes or Playstations. And that's when the value of your electronic toys comes in because you can do that in standing. The age is very important. Most teenagers do not want to continue walking in cafes. That's not all of them, but most no longer want to walk. But the children who are under teenage, up to about 10 or 11, if they lose ambulation quite young, need to be encouraged to keep standing because otherwise their problems, their spine, their joints, their general health will deteriorate much quicker. Obviously, if the boys have severe learning difficulties or behavior problems, then you don't necessarily think that walking in orthotics or standing is useful for them. There is opportunity, does it fit in? Do, can you even get a standing frame in your home? And the other thing about CAFOs, it was mentioned standing in CAFOs, but you need a company who understand Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is exceptionally important. You can't just put any old braces on the boy's legs and expect them to stand comfortably or walk. So this is two brothers and the younger one is still using his cafos. They are very proud for us to use this picture. Um, both the boys went into cafos and both have loved using them. And as you can see, they're both got beautifully straight legs and straight spines. Although the older one doesn't look straight and that's his zip, not his spine. But it helps with joint range. It helps keep the spine mobile. It's a lovely way to exercise and it stops you sitting down all day, which can be in itself a difficult thing to do. But the most important message that you take home from today is just because you have stopped walking does not mean that everything has stopped working. And this is the biggest problem we have around the time of loss of ambulation. The muscles in your legs, particularly your hamstrings, have got to the point where they cannot keep you walking. But that doesn't mean they're not working. That doesn't mean that there are other muscles in the legs that are not still working. There are muscles around the pelvis, muscles in your feet, particularly muscles in your trunk, shoulders, arms that are still working. By stopping walking, they don't just switch off. They need exercise, they need moving, they need blood supply, they need activity. And nothing, as some parents may even know from coming to us here that if a boy turns around and says mommy sit me up when he is lying down and I know from having measured the muscle power they could do it themselves I will say you will stay there until you sit yourself up every time that a parent does something for a child that they could do themselves roll over sit up lie down whatever you are taking away an opportunity to exercise because this is all exercise. 
Sitting up from lying down is core exercise, shoulder exercise, head exercise, arm exercise. You lift them, you are doing your back in, you are working your muscles and taking away an opportunity to exercise. They have to be encouraged to keep going. So often we will take the boys out of their wheelchairs, turn them on their front, which they haven't done for a long time, and make them exercise on their front. And they will say, I can't do it. But you will be surprised what they can do when you actually say, yes, you can. Muscle will weaken without exercise. My muscle will, parents' muscle will, everybody's muscle will weaken without exercise. So if you stop exercising, if the boys stop exercising, there are two things going on. The deterioration in the muscle from the Duchenne and the disuse atrophy. And the comment from Nicoletta about a boy who had lost ambulation for a year, we have put boys into CAFOs after a year, but it is very dependent on several things. What does the boy want to do? Is it fear, scary to actually stand after a year or have they been standing in a standing frame? Are their contractures too bad to do anything after a year? And have, has the disuse atrophy taken over? Because there comes a time when you have let a muscle get so weak that it is really hard to build it up again. And that goes for all of us. But sport, activity, swimming, which is not available to everybody. A lot of these sports are not available because they're not there. Horse riding for the disabled, which we have in the UK, which means there is a person on each side of the horse so that the child doesn't fall off. We don't have children falling off. Getting them on is specially controlled. But in riding for the disabled, there is a person on each side. The issue is not all these things are available for each child in every country. And sometimes they're too expensive. We appreciate that. But that doesn't mean to say you can't find some way of exercising. So we still have to assess after the boys have lost ambulation and actually they are more compliant and happier to be assessed once they have lost ambulation because generally the assessments are much less scary. The EK scale doesn't involve an awful lot of activity and it's about what they do every day. The upper limb scales can be fun and a sensible therapist will not give a kilo weight to a boy who obviously can't lift his hands very high, which is why the scales have been developed with what they call entry items. If you can't lift your hands very high, you're not going to be able to lift a kilo weight. So that you have to be sensible about how you use the assessments. And obviously the MFM has sections and the standing and transfers would not be used, but there is no reason why the other two sections cannot. And I'm sure the French and any other people who use the MFM will still be using it after loss of ambulation. But in the non-ambulant child, contractures cause as many problems, if not more, than in the ambulant child. Tight ITBs can cause pain, particularly in bed at night. They can cause pain when the boys are moved. They might be fine in the wheelchair. They may be fine in the chair or the bed, but moving between the two can be painful. They can interfere with sleep. They can make sitting uncomfortable if you're not constantly moved. And we know we have seen some of the most horrible feet in the world. And yes, some boys will have surgery, but some boys will not be suitable for surgery. Now, some boys are happy to leave their feet in this position but it can cause problems with the wheelchair. It can cause problems of pain on the outside borders of the feet around here. It can cause pain around the ankle and the foot. 
and it can prevent getting their lovely shoes on. It is very difficult to get shoes on a foot like this. Now, if the boys don't mind, that is fine. But we have to consider, do we want to leave feet like this? Are they comfortable? Is this where we're going? Or do we need to manage this before it happens? You cannot manage this any other way but surgery. And I have seen boys with splints that point all the way down and I really don't understand why. They're not making any difference at all. Tight ITBs will cause difficulty with standing in CAFOs because your legs will be wide apart. But this, when you look at the other picture of the boy sitting down in the wheelchair, what you notice is his feet are twisting. And this is not a problem with his feet. This is a problem with his ITBs. And I know a young man who even now has his legs kept together and keeps your feet and you can sit yourself, keep your feet still, let your knees fall out and your feet will twist. And this posture of the feet is a problem of the ITBs. Now, sitting in the wheelchair, you need blocks at the side to keep the knees in the middle. The legs should not be out to the sides because the ITBs will get tighter and tighter, which will cause prob more problems with the feet and a lot of problems in bed. So we can still do active and passive stretches. Sometimes when the boy's limbs are very big, it gets difficult, but it can be done through slings, as we'll see later, the same way that the exercises can. It does become difficult to do passive stretching at an older age. It also becomes more uncomfortable for the boys themselves. But if you can find a position that you can do it in comfortably, where you can both do it, then that's okay. But it does, for small parents, for larger boys, it can be really difficult to keep the hips and knees going. Sometimes you have to give up and concentrate on the arms and the neck. Obviously, splinting through, stretching through position and standing is a good position to stretch. Standing in a standing frame, standing in CAFO, standing in a standing wheelchair. It does help to keep you stretched. Splinting if needed. Serial casting will not really work at this stage because the muscles in the legs are very often very fibrotic and there isn't a lot to stretch. The contractors have been there for too long. And surgery will help, certainly for feet. But we still advocate that the boys wear splints. Now, when the boys lose ambulation, we don't always say night splints. If they are prepared to wear the splints during the day, then they can wear them during the day under their trousers at school when no one can see them. But most importantly, when they're wearing them during the day, the splint has to be a little different and the front of the splint should be short. It should not be long like the night splint. It should be short. It should finish around here so that it will go more easily into a shoe. The plastic doesn't need to be thick. This is quite thin. It shouldn't be too rigid, which is uncomfortable, and it should be padded anywhere there are bones sticking out. But many of our boys will go from night splints to day splints because it's more acceptable for them in terms of comfort. But surgery is necessary for older feet. We had um, a clinic last week with eight boys with Duchenne of whom six are going for surgery. It was definitely a foot clinic. Um, it's not one we've actually done before, but may have to do again. But these are big numbers and a lot of the boys would not wear splints. And it's a shame because you can avoid some of these problems. We don't release hamstrings. They're never that tight in, an, in a non-ambulant Duchenne that they will get in the way. 
and they are very, very painful when released. But after surgery, it is still important to wear the splints. And in fact, when the boys have had surgery to their feet, we warn them they must wear splints afterwards. So the benefits of exercise we know in the non-ambulant boys are good for their heart, their lung and their digestion. People forget this, but it does help get things moving and it does help with constipation. Obviously, it's good for joints and muscles. It's good for bone health because the more you can put weight through your feet and your legs and get them moving, the better. It's good for fitness, although there is actually no definition of fitness and sometimes it's good for self-esteem and for positivity to do an exercise and feel good afterwards we know there are many barriers to exercise at this stage self-esteem may be bad as well as it may be good or body image that the boys don't like to get into sports gear or swimming gear. There may be parental or other influences that are positive or negative. If parents don't have time to get a boy to a pool, if there's no accessible facilities, it is no good again saying you must do it. There are ideals for every family. Teachers and mentors, therapists, if your PE teacher makes PE accessible and shows an interest and gives you sport or points you in the direction of a wheelchair football team or a power chair football team or a hockey team and finds places for you to go, clubs to do, makes it all accessible, that's a real positive and that will help. Success and results are always important. Again, if you always fail, you're not going to keep doing it. But there are still sports, even pool, even snooker, that the boys can do. And many sports like boccia that they can do. And there are many of the boys that can still throw darts, but be careful where they throw them because you don't want a therapist in the way. And again, it's opportunity. And we can make opportunity or we don't. But no parent and no boy should be made to feel guilty for choosing the lifestyle that works for them. So we know that we don't like exercise programs unless the boys ask for them. I had a young man who was so keen on botcher that he used to come every time with a long list of questions from his trainer about what exercise, what activity, what he was going to do with his shoulder pain. So we used to work a lot for that young man on his botcher techniques and his botcher exercises. We need to work the right muscle groups. We can't just work the strong groups. We use something called PNF, which is great exercise for heads. It's this one where we say, don't let me push you, don't let me pull you, stop me pushing you. And it's a great fun exercise that can work for all sorts of parts of the body. We use what we call gravity neutral positions. Working, lifting the arm against gravity gets too difficult. So we work in this plane. We can do sliding stuff. We can do sliding up something. We can do sliding down something. It doesn't have to all be about lifting. We can use slings and the bands. We use the bands a lot as slings and we take the weight of the limbs, the arms and the legs, because once you take the weight of the limb, then the boys can move them themselves. You will be surprised what they can do once the weight of the limb is taken. And that's the same principle that some of the arm supports use, that they can move if they don't have to carry the weight. And while everybody talks about the weight of the head, the weight of a leg and an arm can be equally difficult to move. And obviously, whenever possible, exercise in water is still one of the best exercises you can do. Again, how much, how often? It should be every day. It's as simple as that. But then I hate to tell you that 
all of you in the audience, and I think there's about 208 of you, should all be exercising every day, even if it's walking aerobically, which means not a stroll that's so slow that you don't feel it. But I am sure that a lot of us have to hand, hold our hands up and say we don't exercise every day, except we now have a dog, so we do. But that's another piece of exercise equipment. Not everybody wants one, but it's certainly one way of getting you moving. There are many things that can happen to the spine. And the first thing that we know when the boys are still ambulant, they get this increasing lordosis down here. And the reason that happens is the pelvis is pulled forward by the tight muscles at the front. So they get this increase in lordosis because of tightness and this increasing curve at the back with the growing spine because you have to arch to keep the front of your trunk up. So you start with this lordosis. Then you get kyphosis, which is when you're curving forwards. And that's the posture that so many of the boys are adopting now, this awful kyphotic posture, because everything is done in this position. We know that you can get scoliosis, which is a curve at the back, but we want to look at the pelvis is so important when the boys are sitting, keeping them level and stopping their legs falling out. Because very often when their legs fall out, one may fall out more than the other and pull the pelvis to one side. We need to keep the spine mobile. It's really important that that spine is mobile, that you're not sitting to one side constantly using your uh, sitting where you're writing or using your hand control all the time to one side. And in fact, we are recommending more and more that the boys actually type their schoolwork because it is more symmetrical and less fatiguing rather than curving over when they're writing and persisting with writing, that keyboards actually are better for posture. Not this sort of keyboard, but a well-positioned keyboard on a desk with a separate screen where the boys are looking at. We want the shoulders level. So often we see the boys like this. We need to look at the neck range of movement. And if the boys are going for spinal surgery, we need to work on those arms. This is prehabilitation because the studies show that the one thing the boys complain about is their loss of arm function after spinal surgery. They haven't lost arm function after spinal surgery. What's happened is you have a tiny little squashed up spine and you can get your hands to your mouth and then somebody sticks a rod in your spine and it's a lot longer and taller and your hands no longer get to your mouth. So you haven't lost arm function, but if you're used to working down here and suddenly you're up here, then things do become harder with your arms. So it's undoubtedly true that arm function is lost, but not necessarily strength. And we need to work on that before surgery. We know about horrible posture. And in fact, if this was a room where I could see you all, I would be complaining about how badly you were all sitting. We need to think about looking after parents. We need to think about what they're doing in the home, carrying boys up and down stairs, lifting boys on and off toilets. Again, we know there are families where it's impossible to make changes but we have to try and help look after our families. We know that there is a lot of technology and support out there these days. There are arm supports, equipment for pastimes and hobbies, many, many things that can be got, but it's not available to all families in all countries. Sometimes you just have to get granddad to make something that works. And actually that can be as effective as some of the very high tech stuff you can buy. So we need to keep exercise after loss of ambulation. We need to think that splints and cathos are still in there and have a role, but you need good people making them. 
A painful splint is not an acceptable splint. Sport is not only good for you, but can be very sociable. And I know at least one young man who has met his wife through wheelchair football. So there is a lot of positives in getting out there and doing some sport. But to make informed choices for these young men, you need the information. So unless you have the information, you can't make informed choices. And as I have always said, I would not be an expert without the amazing parents and children that I have got to know over 32 years. Thank you.